Ah, oh, thank you, Adam. I swear there isn't a day that goes by that I do not value the amazing music ministry and our soloists like Adam and how they bless us. Yeah. We are so blessed. <laughs> so, an English professor wrote the following words on a blackboard, all in lowercase letters with no punctuation, okay? Lowercase letters, no punctuation. Woman without her man is nothing. He then directed the students to go and punctuate the sentence correctly. The men wrote, woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. The women wrote, woman, exclamation point, without her, comma, man is nothing. <laughs> now, as a man, I don't know why I love that second one. <laughs> I'm tickled pink. <laughs> it's all about perspective, right? And isn't that one of the core tenets of our teaching? You know, what we teach is that our thought, our belief system, the way we perceive things is the most creative power that we have. You know, the perspective we have of ourselves of others of the world out there directly impacts our experience of life. And all our spiritual practices of prayer and meditation and being of service, tithing, you know, study, coming together in uh, worship in this way, that all of this is for us to awaken to, to expand in our awareness of God's nature that we teach lies in all of us, that God's nature is fully and equally present throughout creation. And the more we can perceive that, the more we perceive a goodness in ourselves, an innate goodness in other beings, no matter how we or they happen to be showing up at any given time, no matter what conditions we're seeing out there in the world, the more we perceive that innate goodness of God as a greater presence than anything in the world and that we are connected with, the more we will be open to finding ways to bring forth that goodness into our lives, to making good of those situations where God is not being fully expressed. And what is that core nature of God that all the faith tradition will teach us? Love, right? I think we've all heard that, that God and love are synonymous. And when we talk about love, we're talking about an energy, a vibration that is for good always to experience life as abundantly, joyfully, peacefully. You know, every version of good that we can experience, love is for that. I love when our founder, Ernest Holmes, said that when describing spirit, he talks about spirit, God is incessantly giving of itself unto itself. That there's a goodness that's always seeking annoyingness and expression of itself in all of life. So the more we can sense that goodness in ourselves, the more we will call it forth and experience it in our lives. And one of the ways to expand in that sense of love, to have a more expansive experience and expression of it, is to recognize and change the ways that we restrict it. And so one of those ways that I wanted to explore today is a pattern that I like to refer, refer to as pedestal syndrome, kind of idolatry, you know, worshiping false gods. And one of the ways that that shows up is loving others so much for certain traits and characteristics that they possess which initially seems loving, right? I mean, it, it's definitely great to value and appreciate others for their virtues and to recognize that and to show them love for it, but can also be confining. You know, when we get to that level of placing people or, you know, organizations or whatever on pedestals, 
it can be restrictive. I also like to refer to this as first date syndrome. Oh, oh, they're just so wonderful. They're just so old. They're so awesome. I just, you know. Imagine <laughs> being told that you get to step up here and live your life just from here. That's a little bit restrictive, isn't it? Imagine if you always had to have your cell phone shut off to be loved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what would it be like, you know, to feel that we have to have to live love a life in a very confined way to be loved? It's it doesn't feel expansive when the person that we place on a pedestal for their courage their compassion, their wisdom, their strength reveals another side of themselves that we don't necessarily appreciate. That would be second date experience. Oh my God, they boom. <laughs> Off they fall from the pedestal, right? That isn't that loving. So I think one way that we can appreciate how that happens is when we look at how we can feel confined by that you know, pedestal syndrome. When we get lots of feedback about how much we're loved and admired for our wisdom, you know, it's hard then to admit to being ignorant about something. We might not feel comfortable doing that because we're so appreciated for being wise. You know, for our courage, our strength, our independence, it might be hard for us then to be vulnerable or to accept help when we need it when we're just so loved and appreciated for our gentleness, our sweetness, our adorableness, it might be hard to take a firm stand when it's appropriate. And I think we all have some idea of that. We're so appreciated for the ways in which we are successful, and that can make it hard to attempt things where we might fail. And in general, I think all of us We're, walk around with this sense of it's hard to admit to our human frailties, our foibles, you know, that they're dark, undeveloped areas of all of our consciousness. And if we can't allow that to be known, then we are confined. We're saying when, when that shows up, I am unlovable. The more expansive version of love certainly appreciates the virtues that we see in others but also expect, respects and accepts the other aspects of our being. You know, that we're multidimensional. I remember a friend of mine who was a feminist who was very involved in promoting women's rights, that after a measure that uh, was put up for a vote to try to restrict discrimination against women was voted down, You know, how the people at the gathering, I was present, both men and women just felt very disheartened, very disappointed. And she made this wonderful speech where she reminded people, please, you know, let's not be discouraged by a setback. There are setbacks for every process of, you know, evolving and moving forward. It happens all the time. Let's remember how much things have improved. And she brought up this idea of, she said, you know, at one time, ladies, you know what our role model was? You know what we were expected to be like? The Virgin Mary. <laughs> Try living a life like the Virgin Mary. I mean, that would be this on tippy toes, right? <laughs> Which I fully expect you think I can demonstrate I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say I couldn't, I said I won't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as my friend put it, you know, how far have we come along from those days? She said, you know, men actually accept us, and, uh, you know, not just men, but women, for who we are, the different aspects of our being, 
And, you know, at one time, the only time we were allowed to put our veil down, we were expected to, was for a few short moments behind closed doors, and then we had to put that persona on again. She said, look at now that we are multidimensional beings. We're actually accepted for having foibles. You know, we're not feeling like, oh, if I show anything that isn't pure, innocent, sweet, gentle, all of which are lovely attributes, but if I show any other side of myself, I won't be loved. And as she wrapped up, she said, to quote the Virginia Slims ad from way back when, we've come a long way, baby. You know? And I think it's, it's really about recognizing how that idea of love that is restricted to these conditions is limiting. And this happens not just with individuals, it can happen with like philosophies, like our teaching. You know, a ways that our teaching gets put on a pedestal. People love coming into this tradition initially when they hear the side of it about, as you start to think affirmatively, as you learn to really believe in yourself and your oneness with God, you can heal your physical circumstances, you can change your financial circumstances, you can get that career you want, that relationship you want, all of which is true. We know that changing our consciousness and having a more positive outlook does lead to shifting a lot of things in the outer world. But if that's all we're about, then we're the teaching that says, we have to make everything perfect in the world, otherwise we can't be happy, which means we're giving our power to the world of circumstances. And there's always a time where people will come up against something that isn't healing, that isn't changing in the way they want it. And that's when it's a time to surrender and say, okay, I need to know that even if this doesn't change, I can be okay, God is still there. I can experience God's nature in some other way. And sometimes when that part of our philosophy shows up as people are making their way through our teaching, boom, we fall off the pedestal. We had a very, very successful minister um, years back Reverend Peggy Bassett, who ran the Huntington Beach Church of Religious Science. Dr. Mark, our senior minister, actually served under her as a practitioner, ran her ministry of prayer for years. And you know, so that's a lot of where he got his training. And Peggy was apparently an amazing, amazing woman. The things that she had accomplished, the adversities that she had overcome to become this incredibly successful woman, and she could demonstrate that to people. She could help them also learn how to get more functional in the world and to demonstrate greater good in their lives. And then one day, she was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease and it was not something that she healed. And there were members of her congregation that dropped away. She fell off the pedestal, and it's such a shame because the lesson they would have learned is she told people, I am actually coming to know God at a deeper level. I'm coming to know this presence that is well-being, that is wholeness in me, that is not dependent on my physical healing. That's the bigger perspective from which we want to operate, the one that can accept all that is and find the good in it, because God is always there. Now, the other side of the pedestal syndrome that I wanted to look at is, rather than putting people up on pedestals or whatever, when we want to just absolutely put them down and condemn them, when we resist directing our love toward those who challenge us. You know, Let's be honest, it's not that hard to love people that we think are lovable, is it? <laughs> that doesn't take a whole lot of spiritual growth. It's fine and dandy to direct our love to those, but you know, all the great masters, all the examples of Christ mind, that to us Christ mind means those who know their oneness with God and see the presence of God in all of us, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, all of these beings taught us that real love is not reserved just for those who show up in ways that we consider appropriate. And they taught us that we should learn to love those whose maybe behaviors we don't like, 
not because that's what God wants and we will win God's favor. We can never be disconnected from God's love. The reason was for us to have a better experience of life. You know, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, not later in the afterlife, now. And so the teachings that we have, like in the teachings of Jesus, love our enemies. Or the Buddha that taught us that compassion isn't one-sided. We don't just have compassion for those who suffer. We have compassion for those who perpetuate the suffering. Again, it's not because it's just the right thing to do. It's for us to have a much more expansive experience of God's goodness in our lives. Now, you know, this is always a difficult subject to approach, and I need to reiterate that loving our enemies is not about embracing inappropriate behaviors, disrespect, bigotry, unkindness, abuse, violence in ourselves or others. It's not about saying some of the things that are happening out there in the world. What happened in London just recently is all okay. It's not about that at all. You know, it's not about going, oh, look at you, you degrading, violent, mean, spirited, boss, public figure, whatever. Look at you. <laughs> you're so cute. Come here. I can't wait to pinch your cheeks. I just, oh, you're adorable. It's not about that. It really is not about that. It's about that expansive love in us that can look at the behavior, that can say it's inappropriate, but that can know that there's a greater presence of God's love and goodness in us than our hurt in them that can be revealed. Because when we stay in condemnation of others, when we stay in resentment and anger and disdain, wanting vengeance, we cut ourselves off from love. We're the ones who suffer. They might be off having a massage and we're standing here going like this. It's not productive. You know, and a revelation that I had as I was thinking about that and working on this topic of pedestal syndrome is actually, I know it feels like when we say no, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to find a way to be at peace with this and go forward with my life. It feels like we're pushing them down. Guess what, folks? We're actually putting their behavior on a pedestal and saying, I will not be at peace. I will not find a way to feel OK and move forward with my life because your bad behavior has such power over me. That visual in my head help me to understand the principle that we teach, that when we continue to hold resentments, we actually give our power to others, that they have to change before we can feel good. It really was a, a moment of awakening. And may I tell you, awakening is not always pleasurable. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> like that revelation, but it really helped me to understand the principle. It's really about, again, knowing that bigger presence in ourselves and others, than the wounds, than the behavior. You know, years ago, I was contacted to do a memorial service for a woman whom I, I didn't know her. She didn't attend our church. The funeral home had reached out to me because they just felt, based on what the family was asking for, that I'd be a good person to do the service. And so when I met with her friends and family, I was given a very, very strict instruction. And that was, do not, do not get up there and pretend that you knew this woman and glorify her and talk about all, like she was this walking angel on earth. We loved her for who she was. There were all these wonderful characteristics, traits that she possessed. But they also explained to me that we had to get on her case sometimes because in the workplace, she could be a real biatch. I think that's what we, <laughs> I think that's what we can say in the sanctuary. But I was really moved by that because by acknowledging her defaults but still loving the bigger person, you know, they gained so much more out of that experience. They were the ones who benefited from that expansive love. And I know I've shared 
with you, you many of you have heard how you know, I was able to shift and heal in my relationship with my dad based on my being able to change my perspective and see how he really did love all his children just absolutely deeply. And that took work on my part, but how, how sweet it was and how at the end of his life, you know, the fact that I still have this, this feeling of just sweet love every time I think of him. But there are those in our family circle, in friends, uh, our, our circle of friends that really put my dad on a pedestal for many of his professional accomplishments for which it was perfectly appropriate to admire him. But when anyone would bring up anything about behaviors that might be inappropriate or hurtful, they just didn't want to hear it. No, no, you know, d d he's like this, right? And recently that came up where someone had talked about something that they had found to be very hurtful and someone else reacted with great disdain. How dare they say that about him? And I had to step in and just say, no, excuse me, I think that actually was appropriate. I've actually experienced that side of my dad's nature and yes, it could be very hurtful. You know what? I know that that's something that he will continue to evolve and grow and you know, learn to be that more expansive presence of love as he goes on his journey. Which one of us doesn't carry something dark in our consciousness? But I can still, as I was saying that, it didn't in any way diminish that sweet, sweet feeling I have about him. I know that was part of who he was, but there was so much more to love, and I can even hold that vibration of love for him to come to heal that part of himself, because I know that's not the way he would want to be if he understood it. So I'm clear that I actually feel a lot better to not be rehashing that memory and going like, oh yes, and starting to feel the negative experience of it. And at the same time, I don't have to pretend that it isn't there or wasn't there. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to say, as long as I just think of this, then I can love my dad. Or as long as I just know him to be like this, I can love him. It feels so much more freeing. It feels so much more expansive. And you know, that, that's the idea that we promote. If you've heard Dr. Mark, when he's encouraged us sometimes to think of someone whose behaviors we don't like or approve of, and to repeat in our head the phrase, I praise you and raise you in the name of love, or say it out loud, what we're really saying, we're not praising or raising the behavior that is hurtful. We're basically saying God's goodness in you is bigger than the behavior I'm witnessing. May you come to know it and realize it and experience it. And we can apply it to ourselves. God's goodness in me is bigger than whatever hurt or whatever bad behavior I'm caught up in right now. May I come to know it and realize it and experience it more fully. That's what we want to do as we go forward and encounter those people that we find challenging. So I want to just remind us that we have a choice. Do we want to limit our experience of love to pedestal experiences under these circumstances, under these conditions? I can love myself, I can love others. Or do we want something more expansive where we can move around a little? Which, which one do we want to choose for ourselves? And a reminder again, that when we are not willing to try to heal our negative feelings about people whose behaviors we object to, we are putting them on a pedestal. So personally, I choose to continue to work on my consciousness, to do my spiritual work, to build a more expansive version of love and experience of love in my life. I hope you'll join me. Let's pray. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So as we turn our attention inward, feeling that part of us that every moment just seeks to experience joy, wholeness, abundance, love, health, vitality, every form of goodness that can be experienced, 
I recognize that as a vibration of God's love that is the very essence out of which everything is created, that each and every one of us is filled and surrounded by that presence of the divine, that we are expressions of it, that it lies fully and equally present everywhere in the universe. And so I claim for us right here, that right now, wherever we feel that we are restricting love's flow for ourselves, for others, let us just be willing right here, right now to let that go and see the expansion of love in our lives to feel that much more connected and uplifted and sustained by the love of God that is absolutely unconditional. We let this prayer be a prayer for our family, loved ones, situations in the world that call to our attention, knowing absolutely that God's love and beauty and wholeness is in all those situations there to be revealed. And by our knowingness, since we're all interconnected, God's goodness is revealed. I know that we are blessed by coming together as a community. We bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful heart for the goodness of God is always, I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen. Amen.